Knowledge is power and the first step in taking charge of your health. If you wanna test yourself for things like testosterone levels, food sensitivity, and sexual health, you need the at-home testing kits from Everlywell. Everything is simple and prepackaged so you can get the answers that you need discreetly and easily. Go to everlywell.com slash holly for 20% off an at-home lab test and arm yourself with the health knowledge that you need. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest today, and this is a very special guest that I have for you, by the way, um, I just want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Everly Well. Um, Everly Well is an at-home lab test that you can take. I did mine for food sensitivity, and I found out that I actually have a high level of sensitivity to pineapple and bananas, which is something I was not aware of. You can also take at-home lab tests for STDs, um, for women's health, and also, of course, for COVID. If you go to everlywell.com slash holly, you will get 20% off an at-home lab test. They make it super easy. You just take your blood at home send it in to with a prepackaged envelope that they already have, and then they get back to you with the lab results. So take charge of your health with Everly Well. That's everlywell.com slash Holly. Okay. Let's introduce my guest. I've been trying to get this girl on this show for so long. I sent her a bunch of DMs, but you know, she is flooded with DMs and probably most of them dick pics. So I was like, she's never going to get back to me because she's never going to see them. And then one day she responded and I was so excited. And so today I am bringing you a true porn legend. She is an avian hall of famer. She has started more than 400 films and now hosts the podcast that I was just on, by the way, Private Talk with Alexis Texas. I am talking, of course, about the one and only fucking Alexis Texas. Hello. Thank you for having me. I love the introduction. I was thinking you pat yourself in the back sometimes. You forget all those things, but it's great to be here. I definitely got flooded with DMs, and so I apologize, but it all came together in due no. timing. And we're here now. I know. It's all it's all good. I'm excited. I, I do recognize that Twitter DMs are probably the worst way to reach out to people, but um But you never know because everybody uses their own platform. Some use mm -hmm. Twitter more, some use Instagram more. And I never use Twitter. Like mm -hmm. I I do it to post things, but not to like go through DMs. And so I feel like with Instagram, they've done a good job of who you primarily uh, follow, can they come up kind of first. Mm -hmm. And then so it filters out the dick pics that I don't need to see. Right. So that's usually the best place to find me is <laughs> Instagram. But yes. I also, though, I will admit that I feel really stupid because afterwards, I think you gave me your number and I went to text you to, um, I think it was about setting this podcast up. And then I realized I had your number in my phone the whole time. I know. I think we, <laughs> when we were doing it, I was like, wait, it's already up here. It's yeah. <laughs> But you never also know, too, because people change numbers, things happen, yeah. and then they could be texting someone, and it's not really like Texas when they thought it was, and they're like, what do you really want from me? Yeah, or <laughs> the, if it's not them, and then they don't respond, because it's not them, and then you're like, wow, they don't like me, and then you get in this whole head fuck thing about, like, what did I ever do to piss off Alexis? <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing at all. You've always been a sweetheart. Your mom, you, everybody since I've met you, every working for you was always a pleasure. You always did great pictures. I had, we did video, too, I think, a couple yeah. times. Um, yeah. But I feel like I was kind of transitioning, doing other things before we really shot a lot of video things. Well, so where you're like where you're at now in the level yeah, of doing stuff. Yeah. And at that point, so so I've known Alexis for we've known each other for a long time. Yeah. And um my mom used to shoot her. And that was a while ago because my mom retired quite a long time ago. Um, and so back then we, you know, that was one of the reasons actually my mom and I kind of split in terms of like working together because I saw that the future was video and she definitely was not yeah. going that way. She wanted to be a photographer and only a photographer, which I understand, you know? Yeah. Um, so we didn't really shoot a ton of video 
And it's funny because I look back at that stuff now and like we like didn't know what we were doing. I'd have like the boom all the way over and like the other side of the room. I didn't know that the boom like had to be <laughs> had close to, be to, you to you to like pick up sound. Like yeah. I just used my handheld, you know, I'd shoot up and I'd get the top of the set. The lighting was I atrocious. mean, you faced it really well because no one could tell that you didn't know what you were doing, at no least idea. not myself. Cause I'm like, this is great. What are we doing? I mean, I always had a great time and everything always turned out great. So, you yeah. know, even though you may not have felt that you weren't doing it, you've definitely figured it out. You've definitely have a name for yourself, not just from working with your mom, but doing your own stuff. So I think that's really awesome as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so you obviously went on to become huge. I mean, you're, you're like still synonymous with the woman with the best ass in the industry, like ever. I feel like everybody is always compared to you. Um, how does, I mean, like, I don't know, does that surprise you? And like, how did you feel about your ass before you came into porn? You know, I've always, you know, it's like my best friend. I got to take it everywhere with me. So <laughs> I can't really be mad at it. I think growing up, um, I definitely saw that it got me a lot of attention. Um, sometimes at the beginning, it was very, it was negative. People making fun of you. I mean, like, oh, like, oh, I can see your ass walking, you know, from in front of you kind of thing. And so I didn't really know how to feel like that, but feel about that. So for me, I feel like I've always made jokes to be like, make it feel like lighthearted. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of fed into that and I just never really cared. So I just took it and ran with it. Mm -hmm. So I was always comfortable in my body, even from a young age and embracing all those things. Um, and then I just, you know, it, I think that for me, especially getting into the industry, um, there wasn't a lot of big booty girls at the time. The very, uh, there was like, um, Brianna Love, and I can't remember drawing a blank of the first one that everyone compared me to, but I don't, it'll come to me towards the whole time, but it was always that. So there wasn't a lot of people to compare me to. So mm -hmm. I think for me, when I hear like, oh, people always talk, look up to my ass, it's kind of silly to me because I just don't think of it like that. Mm -hmm. Very honored, but I don't, I'm like, it's just my ass. But yeah. it's one of those things that I feel like there's, my whole career I've always been like, there's classifications of booties. There's little big booties, there's big booties, and then there's big, big booties. And everybody's booties are very great when their own body. I feel like people sometimes shooting with me earlier on was like, oh, I don't want to be by her. My butt's going to look small. But I'm like, but you look great in your own sense. It's just different sizes, you know? Yeah. I mean, did you ever feel that you had to learn to embrace like a big butt? Because I think you kind of started around the cusp when like curvier girls were starting to be more embraced because, you know, before it was always like really thin women were like the ideal. And I think now that like, we're really embracing curves and like, you know, big butts and stuff like that. Did you ever feel like that wasn't the ideal when you first started? I definitely know it wasn't the ideal. And that's why for me coming into it was because I was so confident in my body and being from Texas and being a curvier girl, I just embraced it. So for mm -hmm. me, it was like, I used to always make jokes like, oh, I'm the girl that can eat cheeseburgers on set or like, oh, you know, so where some girls like well, they would starve themselves because they felt like they had to be a certain way that I just always just was just myself. So it just came natural because I didn't know any other way to be. And then along that came with, oh, you have a big ass or, oh, you're going to be like a butt movies, like kind of thing. So I didn't really know what that was. I just was never around different type of people that didn't look like me until I came to LA. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So maybe that's like me and my experience growing up in LA versus you and your experience growing yeah. up in Texas where I mean, like that was always. You definitely like knew like the porno typical type, you know, it's like, you know, no boobs. It was like super skinny, super blonde hair. And then it became the fake boobs and mm -hmm. like the blonde hair, like that kind of thing. But everything was always generalized as tiny, tiny females. And I'm just, I'm not that. Mm -hmm. And then when I first even got in the business, um, there was people that were trying to make me feel bad about it, I think, but I didn't really know at the time. It was being like, oh, well, your, your value is less than because you're not this. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense to me because I'm actually doing more than what these people are doing. So it's the same, or if not more. Yeah. Um, so it's like really kind of fighting for that because the people try to make it like, oh, well, you're too big or you weigh too much or you this. And I'm like, well, I'm comfortable in my body. I'm not, I don't need, no one said that I need to be on a diet to be in porn. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. And so I was very adamant about standing my ground in that. And I think that's also why I've gotten really far is because I haven't had people sway my opinion. It's been what I've wanted to do through my career. Yeah. And that's powerful. You know, I mean, being able to love and accept yourself as you are is is hard sometimes. And so being able to come into the industry with that kind of confidence, and I feel like that shows on camera and I feel like that shows so much for you. I mean, every 
photo that I've ever seen of you is so powerful. Like you definitely come across as a woman who's like, I am who I am. Like I love who I am. And I feel like people really respond to that. Thank you. I feel like for me, it was the biggest thing was I always said in the beginning, it was like, go big or go home. If I'm going to do it, people are like, you know, you're going to do this. And people are gonna always going to always, always going to be out there. And it's true. And that's why I had to make a conscious decision. But I was like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to be the best at what I'm going to mm-hmm. do. Because if not, like why do it at all? Right. So what made you decide to actually get into porn in the first place? Um, you know, it wasn't a decision that I think that I like aspired to be in porn or anything like that. My my situation was very different at the time. Reality porn was very new and it was like uh, the whole Shane's World type thing where they were going. They had already done. I don't even know what their titles was because I never even watched porn, which is funny enough. But um, so I didn't really know what these things were or what reality porn was either. Um, but I got approached, um, by somebody that they were doing basically a line called college amateur tour, trying to get girls from colleges to do scenes that had never done them before. Um, so I kind of like fell into that whole thing. And then at that point, I didn't think that I would ever do porn. I thought it was like a one and done type thing. It was just like a girl that liked to have sex in college and I needed the cash. And I was like, why not? I'd fuck him anyways. Mm -hmm. So... We late or we kind of continued um, speaking with each other. And then within the next like two months or so, because at this time it was DVDs. So I did it in October of 2006, but it wasn't released until February of, or no, probably like later than that in 2007. So it was out there, but it wasn't out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we stayed, I stayed in contact with a guy and then he was like a company called Bang Bros wants to shoot you. So he's like, would you fly to Miami? So I flew out there in February of 2007 and I shot for Ass Parade. And then with them, with the kids of real, I mean, uh, internet porn, the next day they, or the next week they put a Monday, they do every release. They released that. I was already back in school. And then everybody knew that I did porn because everybody watched Ass Parade, which I didn't know everybody watched porn. <laughs> so it was like, so then there was like my ex-boyfriend made these, like this forum on Facebook was like, do you know a bartender that now is a porn star? Like trying to like bash me and all this stuff. And so I was just like, you know what? This isn't the place for me. I would rather go to a place where I feel understood and seen and not feel ashamed because I am a sexual person and I want to do what I want to do. Cause all of you people are doing that for nothing. And mm-hmm. y'all are fucking each other and doing all these things for free. And yeah. I'm a mindset. I'm a business mindset of women always. So I was like, if I'm going to do it, go big or go home. And Miss Texas hasn't gone home yet. So yeah. <laughs> now, um, I know that some people have asked, like, if you're retired, how do you respond to that? Because I know that you're not, you're not really retired. I wouldn't say it's retired. Like I don't, um, I don't really, I run, I mean, I guess people ask me that, but I don't really answer those questions. Cause it's like, I don't consider myself as retired. I just don't do scenes with other people. You know, I'm mm-hmm. always going to be known as Alexis Texas. And, and I don't have a problem with that and giving me a platform, but I just don't feel like it's encumbering of like my legacy. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? There's just because I do like with my podcast, my podcast is very like, it's not sex related, but my name is in it and I'm mm-hmm. Alexis Texas and people know me as that. So I don't think that I'm, I'm maybe retired from scenes, I guess maybe, mm-hmm. but um, I also too never wanted to make a big like glorified, like, oh, well, I'm doing my last scenes and like all these things because people always came back. Mm-hmm. So I never wanted to do that on a terms of like, when I was just done, I was just done. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't, I always said when I wasn't having fun, I wasn't going to do it anymore. And the business just really changed. And so for me, uh, it was, I was in a place where I was, a, I had a contract with Adam or uh, with Elgin Angel was the last one I had. And it was just easy for me to just do my own thing. And then OnlyFans came around. And so I had the ability to choose what kind of content I did. And I was still touring at the time, um, doing dancing clubs and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. Are you still dancing? I am not. Um, before the pandemic, it was supposed to have like my final like club tour type thing, but it, you know, the pandemic happened and it changed everybody's world. Yeah. So for me, it was like, was that, I know I go back and forth of like, I didn't really get to see my, say my final goodbye to people, like in clubs and stuff that I've gone over the world. Cause I've you know, didn't for over 10 years. And then I go back from like, maybe, you know, things happen for a reason. And that maybe it had been the only reason how I would have stopped, but even mm. though I said I was going to stop. Um, so I don't know. I teeter back and forth and doing that. Um, but I am recently decided to do two Exotica shows. So I'm doing the Miami Exotica in July. Um, so I decided to do that and bring my podcast out there as well oh, that's smart. and do, I'm, I host a twerk contest on stage for them as well. So mm-hmm. just those things where I'm kind of integrating slowly back into the fan world of mm-hmm. not that we couldn't, you know, um, 
be communicated to our fans, like through our DMs and OnlyFans and all of our platforms. But I, I miss the interaction one on one. I'm mm -hmm. a very people person. I minored in sociology. I love speaking to my fans who actually are the ones who are spending the money mm -hmm. and what content they want to see or what they like. And it's interesting now because of the content that I'm giving them, it's more of like my, my podcast and stuff like that. So it's great because for me is it's um, I feel like the first time where I've actually had my opinion and my voice heard mm -hmm. where people have just assumed a lot of things for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you really like kind of transformed yourself from a performer. I mean, you really become a brand. Mm -hmm. I mean, by with your podcast and then on your OnlyFans, are you just doing solo stuff then? Mm -hmm. I bet the guys are still loving it though. They do. You know what I mean? For, what the thing is, is a lot of people, of course, I be, could be making more money, but I make great money for what I do. And they're, yeah. you know, when you have a fan base, then, you know, that are dedicated to you, then whatever you give them, they're going to be happy with, you know, there's no other choice. It's either that or you don't get anything at all. So I feel like I do a pretty good <laughs> job of, uh, kind of still being Alexis Texas and being, yeah. you know, all of the, what those things encumber for people to continue being on my only fan and subscribing, you know, month to month and having that personal interaction. And that's the thing is there's not a lot of places to have access to me. And I've done that on purpose because I like to be, I like to be when I want to let you know and see me, then I'll let you see me, but I don't like to be too um, out there or too accessible, I guess is the word I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause then you get like stretched really thin. I mean, we're really, in a place now where, I mean, so you've been in the needle industry for a while. You've seen it change. What do you think are some of the biggest changes that you've seen? Um, you know, it's hard for me to say that as, you know, I have people that come on my show all the time and they talk about it because they're currently still shooting things. Mm -hmm. So I can see from their point, it's hard for me to internally say on set what's changed because I'm not physically there. Yeah. Um, but from what I've heard, you know, it's hard to get people on set just to do anything because of the amount, excuse me, all right. Um, the, like the amount of uh, money people are making and you know what I mean? And so it's hard for people just to commit to come to set or if they do, they have a shitty attitude or they're trying to do extra stuff on set too and work and do like both. So it's like it's um, I feel like people have become very greedy mm. where I feel like before it's I feel like the companies were greedy and were making a lot of money off of us. And now the performers are being greedy. I don't think that that's terribly wrong in a lot of situations because we should be, reward, you know, awarded the money that we should have gotten prior to. Um, but I also think that's a time, it's a, you know, a time and place. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's, it should be a happy medium. Again, it's why I don't, I couldn't personally come on set and do things. It's because I don't like working for people. I like enjoy working for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just been... I have a schedule and it's just easier to do me. And just the thought of going back on set and doing any of that is just very tra tragic for me. <laughs> you know, for me, it's like, I've been there, done that, I did it for, you know, 10 plus years. So it's not like I haven't done it, but I just feel like too, it comes to a point where sometimes you just gotta let it go. Yeah. I mean, um, you put your time in. Yes, yes, yes. I can't be here until ever. But yeah, I, I just think, you know, there's not also a lot of, you know, stars anymore. I think that it comes where it's like there's only fan girls and people get offended by saying those things. But I think that it's like what the star power of what porn stars in, in my time um, and even with in the industry when I came in, there wasn't still a, there was still stars. But, you know, five years after that, there really wasn't. There may be one or two girls that stuck out that came around and not that they weren't good at what they did, but that actually has a star power that is educated, can talk, can, you know, put on a scene and, and show up and be, resp you know, responsible. Um, there's a lot of things that people don't realize that it's more than just fucking. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a contract with Elegant Angel, right? That was my last. I did. I have had one with Adam and Eve and I've had one with Elegant Angel. And what were, what was the one with Adam and Eve like? Um, for me, honestly, it was, it was, the easiest contract I ever did because it was the least amount of work. Mm -hmm. What I didn't like was it was the least amount of work. I was used to being a worker that right. we worked all the time. You know, when I first started, I did five to seven scenes a week, you know, and that was nothing. Um, and then it just became a routine. So the I think people have idea of contracts and things like that. It's just it's for certain people and it's not for others. You know, mm -hmm. your pay is definitely way less. Um, you are exclusive and it has certain things. But I think by the time I started my contract with them, the contract star power was already lost. Yeah. Like I had already, I was already a, a star without them making me a star. And a lot of those people, I feel like got contracts and became stars because they put the, you know, the power behind them of PR or the movies or the titles, where I felt like it wasn't really that way for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I probably shot the least that I ever did in the year that I was with them. Um, 
So for me, I, it wasn't really something that I was ready to sign up for again. So I didn't. And I went back to shooting. Um, and then with Elegant Angel, it was different because it was me being uh, exclusive with them, but also directing. So I got to direct uh, two movies a month with them, which was a lot of fun because for me, it was the creative side and not just being in front of the camera and seeing the difference of what that really was, but using my skill set of everything that I've learned from set and letting it be my own sexual fantasies come out. So it was really like, um, it felt good to feel like I accomplished something more than just fucking in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. Like it was a whole from start to finish. What are some of the biggest differences between directing and performing? Uh, there's a lot more problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, Logistical issues. For sure. I mean, you know, it could be, you know, an easy day where, you know, everything, you, you know, you plan everything. For me, I'm like, I could be very, um, uh, I wouldn't say OCD, but I can micromanage things. So it's like, you got to do location, you got to do wardrobe, you got to do if, if the girls are going to be on time, what guys you're going to put them with, who's this performer. And nowadays it's, who gets along with each other? Like it's all these other things going on that you have to think about before the sex even happens. So I feel like um, with performing, you just showed up and you did your job. You knew who you mm -hmm. were working with. You knew you were getting your makeup done. You knew what kind of wardrobe you were getting. So it was very simple. Um, I did like the directing side, but the money wasn't there enough for me that I that I wanted to keep doing more. Yeah. Um, so it was just too much because I was directing. I was in it. I was doing everything that it was just like, ah, I can't keep up with this. So yeah. I was like, you know, I commend people that can, but it just definitely wasn't for me. That's the thing. I think what a lot of people may not realize about like when we see directing in porn, you're not just the director. You're also the AD. You're also the producer. You're the yeah. line. Like in regular mainstream, there's like several different producers. There's like a line producer. There's like the executive producer. There's the story producer. When you're shooting porn, if you're the director, you're literally running everything. For you're sure. handling and, and the money. And a lot of it's because of everything. the budgets of what yeah. we give you is like what that used to be to even 10 years from when I first started directing and, and I did it for a year. The budgets we got were like way less. So then now you got to figure out all of these jobs in one thing where you're just like, I don't have enough to pay everybody. So who else yeah. does it? Me. You know, so it goes from those things where it's like. Do I want my mental health to be crazy or do I want to just show up and do what, you know, my job? So yeah. I had to really delegate what was important to me. And that's also why it was easy to kind of segue to what was next for me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't I didn't start that contract knowing I wasn't going to do porn anymore, but it just wasn't. I knew at that time, too, it wasn't fun. I had fun when I was producing it and directing it because it was what I wanted to do. And everybody on my set would be like, oh, it's just like. It's like a party. It's having, but we're having fun. We're getting work done. Mm -hmm. So that was important to me because that's how I started. I wanted porn to be fun. I didn't want it to be like, oh God, I got to go work for this person. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people took the fun away from it. And so I, that was important for me to bring it back. And I felt like I did that and I was good with that. And then I was like, on. What do you think was like the biggest challenge directing? Um, I think people um, not respecting people's time. And it's like, um, as far as like, uh, like scheduling, you know, we, we pay for location We're we're on a time schedule where it's like, we have, if it's four hours for a location, whatever, and you have a girl that's two hours late or doesn't return, you know, respect your time. Or I've had the worst was telling me that they were going to be there, but this never showed up. And there was always an excuse or always this. And I'm just like, I'm a female too. And I understand a lot of things. I'm an empath, but if you're just lying to lie, it doesn't help anybody. So for me, it's just like my biggest pet peeve is lying. And it's mm. just like for no reason where it's mm. like, if you would have told me like, Hey, and maybe you don't have to be as honest as I'm on drugs or I got fucked up last night or whatever the situation, but I can't be there, but don't keep a whole set of people waiting when you're like, Oh, I'm almost there. Like, Oh, I ran out of gas or, Oh, my grandma died now. Oh, this, whatever. I'm just like, that's bad karma. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, so I feel like with those things, I'm like, I just can't do this. I don't make enough money to do this. Yeah. I got to do this shit. And I got to pay a kill fee to the house now. Yeah. Now I got to pay to this person, this. And it's just people's livelihood, you know? And yeah. for me, it's time is time is money. And it's and it's, sometimes it sucks to say that because it sounds so, not I wouldn't say vulgar, but like, oh, you're a diva. No, but it's true. You know, we all have things to do. We have 24 hours in a day. We choose what we want to do with those hours. Some people have families. Some people have multiple jobs. Some people have a lot of things going on. And so 
for me, it's about respecting people's time. And that yeah. was the biggest thing that I was like, yeah, I, I wouldn't even talk to girls sometimes after I knew that. I was like, you want to fuck up my whole set? Oh, yeah, I hate you. Yeah. Hate's a strong word. But I mean, like when I see them at like conventions, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, please just don't even talk to me. Like you don't you really don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so please keep walking. Yeah. I mean, I have found, especially like as I get older, that time is for me the most valuable commodity. Mm -hmm. And it's something, you know, you can never get it back. Like sure. there's only a limited amount of time that we all have in our lives. And I think that that not respecting other people's time is, yeah. Um, I would say maybe it's a pet peeve. <laughs> it's a big one for me. It's, it's definitely a big one for me. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then um, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about more things, Alexis, Texas. So hang tight. We all want to be a healthier version of ourselves, don't we? But sometimes it's hard to know where to find the answers we are looking for whether or not you wanna test your fertility, food sensitivities, or even your sexual health. And this is where EverlyWell is going to make your life so much easier. EverlyWell is digital healthcare designed for you, all at an affordable and transparent price. With over 30 at-home lab tests, you'll be able to choose the test that makes the most sense for you, from gluten sensitivity to metabolism and even STD and COVID tests. EverlyWell is there to help you answer your health questions. Here's how it works. Choose your test and get a testing kit shipped straight to your door. They make it so easy. Everything you need to collect the sample for testing is right there in that kit, even the pre-labeled shipping sleeve so you can drop your sample right in the mail for testing. You'll soon get the results emailed back to you along with helpful guides and information on your results. I took the food sensitivity test and I was amazed at the results. It's definitely helped me adjust my diet to make sure that I'm avoiding the foods that my body is reacting negatively to. And for listeners of the show, EverlyWell is offering a special discount of 20% off an at-home lab test. All you have to do is go to everlywell.com slash holly. That's everlywell.com slash holly for 20% off your next at-home lab test. You can also click the link in the episode description. Knowledge is power and EverlyWell is here to help you take charge of your health with that knowledge. All right, guys, we are back. So Alexis, um, Considering all the experience that you have and the time that you've spent in the industry, is there anything that you, with what you know now, you wish you had done differently when you started? Oh, um, no, I really don't. I'm a big person on, I don't have regrets. There's things that I maybe would have done differently, but I also feel that if I wouldn't have done them, I probably wouldn't be in this chair. Mm. So I feel like things happen and lessons happen and sometimes it sucks and certain, you know, everybody goes through their things. But I don't think that there's anything that I would change about how I entered the industry, how the people that I chose to be like from agencies and stuff. And people talk about, you know, talk shitty about the agency that I've chose for a long time and then, the, you know, who runs it and stuff like that. But for me, I've never had an issue. I've never, you know, nothing but respect. So for me is was there hard times? Of course. But I think that's with anything that you do. Um, so I definitely I, I don't think that I would change anything. What advice would you give to new girls looking, considering getting into porn? If somebody would come to you and be like, hey, I'm thinking about getting into porn, like for what sure. was the one thing that you would tell them? Um, you know, for me, it's, um, let's see. Um, uh, you really have to make a decision of if it's really what you want to do. It's not, you know, it's not about, yes, we make, you know, easy or people say easy money, but it's really not easy money. You know, it's for fast money or whatever it is. But the thing is, is like they told me when I first started many moons ago was, it's always going to be out there. Yes, there is a lot of porn, but it's always going to be out there. So you have to really choose and decide if it's for you or if it's not. Because even if you just do one or two scenes, it's still going to be out there. And someone's going to say whatever they want to you. But if you internally are okay with what you choose to do, then to each his own. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you still like have any kind, like do you, does the stigma of working in the adult industry like affect you in any way today? Um, I think definitely. I think that people in the in adult entertainment industry, regardless if I, you know, was in the industry 20 years ago, five years ago, whatever, I think we always will always be have a stigma of 
I don't really know what that stigma is for them, but I feel like there's always like, oh, well, she was in porn. Oh, it's like whatever. Like it's very, like it's very almost, they try to put shame on it, which I've never felt shame for doing what I chose to do. I think that in the mainstream world, sometimes they don't want to deal with us because of either everything from sponsorships or this or whatever, where I think now they're, we're breaking down those walls where it's like, hey, we're people too, or hey, it's not just because I wasn't in the industry doesn't mean I'm about fucking every five seconds of my life. I think that it's really kind of doing people with podcasts and platforms and things like that of giving us a voice to show that we're more than just what we've done in our past. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you actually if you think that like social media played a hand in that and kind of changing people's perspective about the people in the adult industry because it gave you that like ability to be yourself online, which good for some people, maybe not so good for other people. <laughs> I think yes and no. I think um, I do think that it gives people a really good platform to show who they are. But I also think like with myself, um, as much as like I have, a, you know, my podcast and stuff like that, that was really the first time that I've become vulnerable and things like that. Because to social media wasn't like I'm not Alexis Texas 24 seven. So my social media is Alexis Texas. So for me, it was hard to sit there and and write or have these videos or these stories about what I'm doing all the time because I'm not always Alexis Texas. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's a part of who I am and will always be that, but I don't do well with me being like, hey, my days are it's just not me. I don't know so, how people you know what I mean? do that. So all I could the time. do it in a room like this all day when because I know things are on, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I can be myself. But that just wasn't for me. So sometimes I feel like people we're like, oh, well, like you don't have a personality or you don't have this because I didn't talk as much. But that's I mean, when they'd meet me, that definitely wasn't the case. But that's what I'm saying. So it's give and take. I think as far as social media, I think sometimes it gives our fans too much of a voice to um, kind mm -hmm. of critique what we're doing or to dehumanize us in certain senses. And I think sometimes people are um, inc incapable of kind of weeding out what's right or wrong of what you should take in. For mm -hmm. me, I don't look at any forums. I don't, yes, I see comments, but I don't, it doesn't personally affect me. Do I know those things exist? Yeah. But I feel like the internal struggles are within myself and what, what I feel and not what everybody else wants or me to be. Yeah. So you don't really like read the comments or like take no. in any of that negativity. I do not. I've never, like, I mean, people used to say all the time, like there used to be what is it? Adult DVD or whatever the adult thing, DVD those, those talk. forums yeah. are just like, there was so many about how I'm racist and I'm this and I'm that. And all these things where I'm like, you want me to come back and say things where it's like, if you have a conversation with me and I've met anybody, they know that that's few and far between that I'm not any of those things, but they want a reaction. I feel like sometimes to people that were directors or owners of companies actually would, would target people too to kind of get you Route up to be like, oh, but I'm not, and then do it. And like, I was just like, I'm not playing into any games. I've always said from the beginning is I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's just how I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to choose to see me. There's thousands of other girls out there doing what you want. And it's not me. Right. What gave you the idea to start your podcast? You know, I didn't never, or I never knew I wanted to have a podcast. It kind of fell into my lap too of what was I going to do next? Or what was I going to do? Um, I started hosting for Exotica's, I would do the twerk contest on stage and it just came very natural for me to speak to people in, um, in an open format kind of way. And I saw the reaction of it and I really enjoyed it. So I was looking for a way to kind of get across who I really am and give people more content of me. So in the beginning, and I talk a lot. So, so it was like, <laughs> what else can you do? And at the time people, podcasts weren't as crazy as they are now. And now everybody has a podcast, which good for them. But I also feel like they don't realize how much work it really is. And, you know, I'm on season three of mine. We have 82 episodes, but it's work. You know what I mean? And sometimes it's rewarding and sometimes it's not, but it's fun for me. So regardless of that, I, I feel like I'll always kind of do it. I always like make jokes of like, I'm Dr. Texas or like in those things, because people like to have the conversation and ask questions or advice or whatever. So I think within having more conversations with people from different walks of life has also allowed me to be vulnerable and get those gifts of myself to other people as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think has been like the most rewarding thing about starting a podcast for you? I think just honestly, the biggest thing is when I have people in my chair that don't know who I am or do anything like that and have just come because of like my business partner has like been like, hey, especially in the beginning, I didn't have a reel to show what my podcast was about. So people were really like, oh, she's important. What did she want to ask me? Is she going to mm -hmm. ask me what crazy stuff? So I think with that was when they would come, 
we'd have great conversations. And every time people would walk away, we'd be like, wow, you're really smart. Or, oh, wow, you really know how to talk. You can hold a conversation. And so just changing the mindset of not that I needed to prove anything to anybody but myself, but knowing and like the humanizing part of like, we're all just people. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? As long as we just sit down and have a conversation that's honest, you can get through a lot of things. Yeah. What have been some of the favorite episodes that you've done besides one with me, of course, which I'm sure is at the top of your list. We're doing great. It just came out this week. We're doing awesome numbers. For sure. Um, You know, it's it's surprising is one of my, the first one I ever did was with Carl Kanai. And uh, I had known him. uh, He's a fashion designer. I had known him before, um, but on like a friend level, I met him through um, other, like a a friend of mine. And when I had him in in my chair, I learned a so much about him that I never knew. So that was cool is because sometimes, you know, as people or what we're, what we're doing is sometimes we don't like to talk about ourselves. We don't like to talk about our achievements or like things like that. Cause it's, we don't want to be like this egotistical person. Mm-hmm. So hearing his journey and how it started and everything was really inspiring and really cool to see like how that progressed. Um, so that was one that really stuck out to me and it was a first. So it was like really cool to see the, um, the back and forth with somebody and like how that I could actually ask questions and like moderate a podcast or do, you know, right. Yeah. Um, and then I had another one with King Los was, um, he's a, a rapper entertainer and I had such a spiritual conversation with him that neither one of us thought that that's where I would go, but it was such an insightful thing and conversation to have, um, that I feel like it kind of, um, elevated me to another level. Mm. So for me, I feel like those ones where the conversation just goes to places that you may have some interest in, but when you find another person that is, has a similar interest, how deep that conversation can go. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Right. Because it's like, we never, I probably said this on your podcast, but we never really like have the opportunity to sit down face to face with somebody without distractions from like media and stuff like that. And, and have like real heart to heart conversations. And when you have those, those interviews and those episodes, it just makes you realize like how powerful human connection is for sure, and how kind of starved I feel like we are for it these days. I agree because I feel like there's not enough genuine people in the world because people always want to just either give you what they want or like, it's like what people think they need. I feel like Mm -hmm. sometimes we kind of forget that we're just human. Um, Like I had somebody on my show yesterday and he, you know, I've known him through the industry, like you've hung out, but not like, um, like on sets, but like we've like, uh, went to like different award things, whatever together. And in the chair, he was like, you're just so different now. You're just like this spiritual person. I was like, but you never knew me. Like we never had a one-on-one conversation until today. I'm like, we had like party conversations and, and outside noise, but we've never had a conversation. So even with that and knowing that person for seven, eight years, but you didn't really know that person. So to Mm -hmm. me, that's what the deeper connection with my, is like private talk is getting those private conversations that you wouldn't have without the noise. Right. Yeah. You mentioned spirituality. What, what is your spirituality? Um, you know, I've kind of gone through my own journey. Um, like within the last two years, I've just been tapped. I've always known that I'm empath, not knowing what that really meant and just how deep I've felt things. And I've always had, like, for whatever reason, people feel very comfortable speaking to me about topics of, like, personal things that I wouldn't know. And, like, not just, like, friends, like strangers. So I've had people come up to me, approach me about a lot of things. So I didn't know what that meant. Um, Tapping into those things, I realized that I do, I have a stronger, like, feeling, um, of feeling things from people's pain and, you know, energy like that. So I've just kind of in tune to those things. Um, I don't really have like, um, I mean, I believe in God, I know all those things, but I don't like when I think about spirituality, it's about a higher being as well. Not really a God being, but um, a spirit gods and things. Mm -hmm. So I'm into crystals. I'm into energies. I'm into just the feelings of things. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me is during the pandemic, I feel like everybody, you know, was going through a lot of mental health issues and things like that. And I feel like for me, it was the first time that I actually had to sit in my own issues and problems and things like that, because I'm a worker. I've worked my whole life, you know, and so being, you know, I've been through a divorce. I've been through all these things where I worked. I didn't deal with the problems of what that internally meant. So for me, I had to dive into my spirituality to really find who I was and who, where I started and where I began or where I, the beginning of like, where does Alexis, Texas end and where does Alexis begin? Mm -hmm. So I needed to find those things. And so for me, it was just having a different belief. And so it was like into more into meditations and just, just finding my inner self. 
Um, and yeah, so that's kind of what my spirituality is to me. Yeah. So you've mentioned, um, and anybody who follows, you can see that like, you're very business oriented. You're probably kind of more like type A, right? Like you work really hard and all mm-hmm. the time. How do you find like that work life balance? And then is, is that something you struggle with? Um, it has something that I've struggled with in the past. I think again, like when I say spirituality, people are like, oh, like, what is that all like mean? But I think a lot of that too helped me with that is because it was finding balance in anything. Um, and it, you, when you're in one way or the other, the scales tip, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like, yeah, I was really great at work, but my personal relationships weren't very successful because I chose to work. Um, so you have to look at really within yourself and knowing why do we do those things? And so for me, I had to learn the balance. Um, It's still a struggle. Um, I definitely have a better understanding on it now because I also think, like I keep saying, like pandemic, but I think with with the pandemic happening, we realized that it's okay to slow down and still be able to make money. Mm -hmm. Where before it was like, I was traveling here, this, that, and I felt like I had to or I wouldn't be successful, which it was like a different, it changed a mindset. It was like, no, I could be successful anywhere. I just like, what is important to me? Mm -hmm. Is traveling important or is staying at home and shooting OnlyFans content or doing a podcast? What do I want to spend my time to? For me right now and the journey that I'm on is, I liked being home. I liked being, you know, having the whole like a routine. Um, I liked having those things. And that's why I think for me is I'll eventually get to the family aspect of like having that whole entire part instead of like where it's just singular because Mm -hmm. before I just haven't really searched for it because I didn't want it. Yeah. I yeah. thought I wanted it, but I didn't want it. Or you didn't know what you wanted. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, that's that's how we learn, right? I mean, all of the mistakes that we make, all of the bad relationships that we're in just help teach us about what we what we really actually want. And then we life. don't learn those lessons, it keeps coming back and back and out again. So that's it, why my thing is like, God dang it, they're different people, but it's all the same fucking problem. It's so true. So, it's but, so yeah. funny. I was talking about someone just before you came on, like how the universe just puts the same problem in front of you over and over and over but again. It's not really the universe, you it's it. yourself. It's because when we think is like we don't realize when we're not dealing with what what we're supposed to be dealing with we're attracting that same type of person Mm. so we're either trauma bonding or we're like have similar things which you want nothing to do with that person but immediately you do or it's a physical attraction but the underlining truth of what who you two people are is not the same and that's why for me it was more about i think um when you like seek outside validation from other people like being in porn it's like oh i wanted this like or oh i wanted this whatever but it's like what do we do it for but yeah. it's a bigger picture of it. So that's kind of more of the route that I'm at. What do you think is the bigger picture? For me is, of course, I want people to like my picture. Of course, I want whatever. But I don't need the outside validation to make me feel like a woman or make me feel successful. For me, it, um, I would rather feel good about what I'm doing, the content I'm doing, how I want to do things, other than what people want to see, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's like... It's a struggle because it is like you, you know, we are a brand and we are like, you know, I'm Alexis Texas and I have all these things. And I do like the attention that that brings, but I don't need the attention to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like trying to separate the likes that we need on Instagram or whatever that we know converts to paying members on Mm -hmm. OnlyFans or, you know, like money. Yeah. Or is it you know, the validation that we like that hole in us needs, you know, and it's like trying to separate that out because sometimes my husband will say to me, you know, like get off social media or like, you don't need to be on it so much or take a break. And I'm like, you don't understand. This is directly connected to my income. This is like what I have to do for my business. But then like, sometimes I'm like, but am I being that honest with myself? Do I really need? See, and that's the part too where it struggles is because it's like, what are we wanting it for? Is it because of the money thing or is it because, and then the people start to like look at other people because envious or they like, mm-hmm. you know, have FOMO because people are doing this and you're not doing it or your body doesn't look like this and this person this. So all those things is what I don't like from it. I love the fact that it gives us a platform that we can promote all of the things that we want to do and those mm-hmm. things would still be done. I just don't think that it needs to be the end all be all. Like it's, does it, like I said, it's not going to like, I, I mean, let's just say, well, I don't even want to put that out there because I don't want it to happen to me. But how people with their social media, if things get like taken down or like mm-hmm. deleted, it's like devastating to them, which yeah. it should be devastating because it is our income. But 
you still were the one who brought those things, you know, you could still build it up again. Mm -hmm. Like you have all the same tools that you did that to make that page in the beginning yeah. to make something else better or whatever. You know, for me, it's like every problem always has a solution. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what are your career goals now? What is the future for Alexis Texas? My career goals. Um, for me, I have a lot of different things in the works. I have, for me, it's about continue building my, you know, my brand and my legacy, you know, really transitioning into the media world and the podcasting side of stuff. Um, I when I put my podcast on tour, we're gonna, you know, do some cities um within the in 2023. Um, I have a cannabis thing I've been working on. I have a clothing merch that I do with this company called Loopsify. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of, you know, just doing it. I feel like, you know, I don't have, I've never known those people who was like in five years, I'm going to do these things. I don't know what I'm going to be doing in five years. Yeah. Um, everything I think changes. COVID should have taught us all that. For that, sure. Like you can never predict what's going to happen. As long as I'm, you know, happy and I'm, you know, in a good space and like that to me is all that really matters. Yeah. So you're saying you're going to take your podcast on tour. What's that going to be like? Is it just going to be you or are you going to have various guests on? Um, so right now uh, we're kind of like in Miami Exotic is probably kind of our first time to like put it on the road. So that will be um, uh, guest type versions mm -hmm. of it. I don't know. Like that's kind of our guinea pig test to see how that's all going to work out. But my show definitely is, is all guest based. I mean, I can talk a lot about everything, but I think people like to have the interaction yeah. um, with other people. And so the the motive of, of it is for the people that haven't been in L.A. either, you know, we can go and see them either if it's in New York or Miami and mm -hmm. get those people that can't come to L.A. Yeah. So I guess we're going to come to you. Right. So, but you would probably then stick to like big metropolis cities where you know that you have people that you want to have on the show and they live in that area. For sure. Yeah. That yeah. totally makes sense. That's our first, our first route. Right. And then, um, you're also moving your podcast over to Patreon. I am. We're, we're doing the, um, after dark episodes on Patreon and we're keeping the other, ep the regular episodes on YouTube mm -hmm. just because a lot of flagging, we couldn't really like do certain things mm -hmm. that I want to give my fans, a, a you know, the real Lexus Texas, the real after dark episodes and like the more nitty gritty things. So explain, um, for anybody who hasn't seen your show and why haven't you seen it? This is true. Um, what is the difference between private talk and after dark? So pri they're both, it's private talk. It's private talk with Alexis Texas is the podcast private talk after dark are for all the adult entertainers and the, like kind of in that creative space, only okay. fan girls, like all the influencer type people that talk a little bit more riskier than other people. Right. Um, and then the private talk regular shows are just like from entertainers to sports people. I've had activists on there. Um, doctors, medical doctors, I've had all kinds of people just to talk to. So it just kind of break up the, what kind of audience base that people want. Some people just like the lifestyle and entertainment. And then some people want a little bit more. I mean, you can have both with the private talk. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite things about having a podcast is being able to talk to so many different kinds of people, but also you said do medical doctors on, I've like learned so much interesting stuff. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, you don't, people don't think that we like, I'd have that kind of guess, but I'm just like, I could literally talk to anybody. And mm -hmm. it's, you know what I mean? And the thing is, is what you bring to the table, like what's, mm -hmm. you know, you have. And so I feel like it's cool to see different genres coming on and letting people know and talking about what they have going on. So I think it's, it's fun. Is there a certain like parameter that people have to meet to be on your show? Um, or you just have to be interested in like them and their story? For me, honestly, the beginning, I really didn't. It was more or less, it was like, who wants to come in my seat? You know what I mean? <laughs> or in my chair. Um, but I, for me, it's like if I, I, even from when I was doing conventions and stuff before, like I didn't have porn girls sign for me. I had girls that I had met in different cities that I wanted to give them a platform to see what that was like. So it's mm -hmm. kind of the same way too. It's like, if you have a platform and you want to be willing to be open and honest and vulnerable with me, then I'd love for people to come on my, you know, in my show. Mm -hmm. What has been like some of the biggest surprises that you've had of on your show? Have you had people come on and like, they just tell you stories that like you were not expecting? Uh, it can get pretty interesting because some of my shows, like, I mean, so if you haven't watched my show, uh, we do a full like interview and then the last 10, 15 minutes we play a game called truth with Texas. So it's like, Truth or dare, but it's truthful questions. Each one is an ace, it, it, different types of questions from spicy, naughty, kinky, romantic. And so when those people sometime that aren't the after death, after dark people <laughs> that tell some pretty after dark things on Truth with Texas, um, it's interesting because again, it, it, it makes you humanize of like, we're all sexual people. Mm -hmm. People like to have sex. That's how we were 
created Mm -hmm. from sex. Right. Um, So it's funny sometimes because like how you made the joke of like, oh, you didn't think that your stories were interesting. I sometimes when their stories, I'm like, I've never even done that. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Like I had this one guy. It was it was I mean, we definitely because we drink and smoke on my show. It's Mm -hmm. very like um, open like format in that sense. And so he definitely I don't know if it was tequila or what alcohol he was, but it was, was towards the end of the show. And he just says that he fists all the girls that he's with. But I just was like, you just like, how? first of all, where do you find these girls that are just going to let you fist them? And do you have this conversation before? Or do you have big hands? I'm pretty sure that okay. I think about it because he was a bigger dude. So he okay, had so to have. Might, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I was just like, do you, is there a technique? Like, what's going on? And then my girlfriend's listening and she's like, yeah, like she's all for it. And I'm, the best. <laughs> I'm just like, no, like that wouldn't happen to me. Like. I would just be like, excuse me, sir, like, <laughs> are you okay? Do you know what you're doing down there? Like, I don't know. So yeah, you'll just get off the wall things. Like, again, I have, um, I feel like I have an act of people feeling comfortable, and especially at that time to tell me those stories because they're like, well, she's not going to judge me. And I right. definitely don't judge anybody. I'd rather have that, you know, vulnerability. Um, so it's definitely cool to see like, oh, okay, I see what I'm talking I kind of, I see what kind of sex you're into. <laughs> What's your porn, your porn search history? You know, what's so funny is that like, <laughs> I, I feel like I have like the opposite of kink shaming. You know how like people in the normal world feel like ashamed because they like, like kinky stuff that to us is like not a big deal, like, like oh, fisting, that? like mm-hmm. whatever. I feel like I'm the opposite where like, I'm so vanilla and like not particularly interesting in my sex life that like, but working in the adult industry, I feel like I should be crazier. Mm. And I'm just like, I'm not that kinky. And people are like, well, why not? Like one person asked me if I get turned on when I shoot scenes and I'm like, no, I don't. Like I'm there but to just do that work. I don't think that doesn't make you kinky. There's nothing any fetish wise that you yeah. like do. Like there has to be something. Like you're just not like a like fine, just fuck me. I am a starfish. Like- 100% I'm just a fucking starfish. <laughs> you're starfishing like, it all the time. Get it over with. <laughs> Put your semen inside me so we can have another baby. But you've baby. Not always like, been that way, though. That's what I'm saying. There has to be, like, no, a definitely. balance. Because I think, like, I feel like I said, with my friend being excited about the fisting, I'm like, but I'm excited about a lot of other things, too. Yeah. So it's just, like, your kinks are just a little different. Yeah. But I still believe that you're a sexual person because of the fact, like, there's just no way. Yeah. You've seen too much. You've done so much. Like, you either tried something or you're just not telling us <laughs> what's going on <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah that's so true but it was yeah it was funny if your so bedroom they, walls could talk <laughs> they'd be like she's a starfish <laughs> don't believe this holly don't believe this but this one guy was like well you don't get turned on during your scenes he's like well then what's the point of like being in the industry and i was like because i'm working yeah i'm like I'm i don't creative. know like I'm for just... me i think it's like the part of like that I could be, I could make something sexually erotic for someone to be viewing pleasure. Like, you yeah. know, and for me, because I always just say, like, we're like people helping people when orgasm at a time. Yeah. I had one girl told me that and that stuck with my head and like forever that I was like, that's the perfect thing. That is nice. And, you know, but it's true. It's because I had one thing I loved about touring, even in the beginning when DVD like were out and like store signings were still a thing. Um, people would always come up to me, especially like, thank you. They would thank me and I'm like, why? Like it was whatever weird. They're like, because you gave me the confidence of being a curvy girl and not feeling like I had to look like all the other girls in the business mm-hmm. and like just being a sexual person and being open and not feeling bad about it. Yeah. So for me, that gave me like the justification or validation that I needed to be like, okay, this is why I did what I did. It was because yeah. not only am I feeling good, but I'm making other people feel good that you don't have to look like the cookie cutter, quote unquote, blonde hair, big tits, like whatever girl, or you can and still have the same thing, but you don't have to be in one category. I think that, you know, opening it up for everybody and making people feel comfortable in their own skin was a really beautiful thing for me. Yeah. No, that's got to, I mean, it's really nice when you get to, you hear that feedback about how you make other people feel good about themselves. And it's a strange thing to think that like you would have that kind of effect on like a complete stranger. And and because of sex. Right. Which is something that. Because some people act like they're like, well, like, you know, I'm like, you really don't know me. I'm like, you like my doggy style and you like my fuck me eyes. But like, there's a lot of things you're still teaching, but it is like on a personal level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Alexis, thank you so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Yes. I've had an amazing time. Good. Um, we're going to do a little Q and a for my Patreon. So if you're a member, you'll be able to check that out. 
Um, but otherwise, Alexis, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? I most certainly can. So you can find me on Instagram, white girl politicking with the G. Twitter is Alexis underscore Texas. And my Instagram for my private talk podcast is the private talk podcast. And you are on YouTube as well, right? I am on YouTube. It's the private talk with Alexis Texas. Perfect. And you guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Holly Randall. Um, and also on YouTube, obviously you might be watching this on YouTube. You might be listening to this on the audio platforms, but if you're listening, it's youtube.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. I just, uh, started doing memberships so you can actually join my YouTube channel. It's, um, at a very low one tier right now, $2 and 99 cents a month. You get your own badges next to your name and uh, custom emojis and access to some exclusive videos. So go check it out. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week. <laughs>